And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. This virus, it has no eyes, and yet it knows exactly how we see each other and how we treat each other. And let's be clear, there is no vaccine for racism. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. about that particular edition of Veep Thoughts is that I think, I think that was scripted. I, like, I think she meant to do that one. That's amazing. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to subscribe to Blaze TV. Use the promo code Stu to save 10 bucks. We have Matt Kibbe going to war with Kathy Griffin today. Uh, BLM unleashing an avalanche of BS. But we start by doing the Biden price hike. No, not the Putin price hike, the Biden price hike. Today... We saw some interesting things. Let me just give you a little quick anecdote on the news coverage we saw today. First of all, there's this story. Big cuts coming for CNN Plus after a slow start. They are claiming it looks like they have only 10,000 subscribers and they've spent something like $300 million on this service. Can you, like, wasn't anyone there saying, guys, People don't even like our regular shows. They're not going to pay for this. We're not going to make $300 million back. You want to spend $300,000 on a service? I still think it's risky. But maybe over time we could get that back. Maybe $300 million. It's completely insane. And it shows how just absolutely delusional that network is. Um, And, I'll, you know, look, there's reasons for it. We know what their coverage is like. Number right now, let me give you a couple of headlines from today. Um, Biden approval rating is now at the lowest point in a, C- in a CBS news poll. We told you about this a little bit yesterday. Forty two percent. It's as low. Some of the highlights, uh, the high point for him was Ukraine. Now, think about how Ukraine is going like we're in the middle of watching one of the worst events in the past 50 years. And that's his high point. Uh, But he has a 45 percent approval, the high point of all the categories measured, 39 percent on crime, 38 percent approval on immigration. But way down at the bottom, 31 percent on inflation. It's his worst category. Seemingly pretty bad. When you ask people in a separate poll, they asked, what is the top problem in the country right now? Number one was inflation. Number two was the economy overall. OK, so that is the focus. That's what people care about. That is what's going on. We get a huge report today uh, that the consumer prices rose 8.5 percent in March, slightly hotter than expected and the highest since 1981. Inflation surges to 8.5 percent highest in over 40 years. Let me give you the CNN homepage right after that news broke. Here it is. Now, yes, there are other big stories uh, like uh, Ukraine, of course. Uh, that's that's up there. You have an update there. You have uh, an emergency waiver on an ethanol ban, which at least has kind of something to do uh, with this, although it's a, yet another way of uh, a terrible way of doing it. You even have stories, uh, uh, you know, they are covering things like Britney Spears being pregnant. But where is the inflation report? Again, this is CNN right after this news breaks. Well, look a little closer, boys and girls. There it is, way over there on the right side. The second one, it's going to be zoom in a little closer. There it is. Consumer price inflation hit a new 40-year high in March. The number one story that everyone cares about. But, hey, Britney's pregnant. So let's, <laughs> let's get some coverage in on, on the Britster and uh, the upcoming child, which is going to be, by the way, raised really well. And I think... Right now, you can, you can be confident that that entire situation is going to work out really, 
really well. Uh, let me give you the graph of inflation over the past 40 years or so. This one uh, is the one we showed you. This is from yesterday and shows where the inflation was already at a high point from the down ramping of the Carter administration as Reagan took over back in 1980. And you see, uh, it's the highest it's been since then. Updated for today, we go from 7.9 to 8.5%. Now I will say, these numbers eventually will start coming down most likely. Why? Because when you have an increase uh, uh, built on a higher number, that percentage will look better when you measure it against a previous year. So. Right now, we're, we're, uh, we're still measuring that that 8.5% is 8.5% higher than when uh, in, in very early 2021. Um, soon, we think, we hope, unless we turn into Zimbabwe, those numbers will start coming down when you measure them year to year because of the increases that started when Biden took office. However, that will still not be good. It will not be impressive. And it really is amazing when you look at this from president to president. This has been something very specific that has gone on in the Biden administration. And it's not all Biden's fault, but a good chunk of it is. Uh, that is not, however, what Jen Psaki wants you to believe. Here she is trying to explain herself out of this catastrophe. So because of the actions we've taken to address uh, Putin, the Putin price hike, we are in a better place than we were uh, last hike. month. Um, but we expect March CPA, CPI headline inflation to be extraordinarily elevated due to Putin's price hike. And we expect a large <laughs> uh. difference between core and headline inflation reflecting the global disruptions in energy and food markets. So core infl inflation doesn't include energy and food prices. Uh, headline inflation does. And of course, we know that core Core inflation, you know, energy, the impact of energy, of course, on oil prices, gas prices. We expect that to uh, continue to reflect what we've seen uh, the increases be over the course of this invasion. Got it. The uh, Putin price hike. How do I say Putin price hike any more than I'm saying it? She's just trying to fit it in. Like it's like they really sat around a table and were like, what if we call it the Putin price hike? People will definitely remember that. And we'll only lose 200 seats in November instead of 225. This is a pathetic attempt. Now, it is important to note uh, that it's not entirely Biden's fault. And we'll get into that here in just a second, because it is an important part of the story, even though maybe not the, the most comfortable. I happen to be the person who likes to bring uh, news that you might not want to hear. And why do I do that? I don't know. I just uh, seem to not like being happy. I don't know what the, the, the issue is. Um, here is the chart back in, going back to uh, 2002. This is inflation. And we are in Chartapalooza land, boys and girls. Conserva nerds, unite. As you see, let's, uh, let's identify this by the president. Let's uh, start off at the beginning. This is with George W. Bush. And Bush is, of course, those first few years. And as you see, it rises up a little bit, uh, but mainly bank, uh, bounces back and forth between, you know, say one and five percent right before the 2008 uh, financial collapse. Then, of course, Obama takes uh, power and he is restrained by a pretty aggressive conservative caucus. This is the Tea Party era. They put in some good rules to cut back spending and really inflation never really gets uh, goes crazy and gets out of control. Donald Trump takes office. And as you note and note where this line is drawn here, inflation is actually very low. Uh, gets even lower, of course, during the pandemic and it rises up a little bit afterward. And then, of course, you have Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. And when you look at what is in the Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Uh, little rectangle there, what you see is a skyrocketing inflation rate almost immediately as he comes into office. It really is amazing. And they keep trying to say the Putin price hike. Let me show you the Putin price hike. Here's where he invaded Ukraine. Now, yes, it has gone up in that month, uh, but 99% of this or 95% of it happened before Putin did much of anything with Ukraine. This, of course, as everyone knows, is a pathetic excuse and an attempt to spin themselves out of this current crisis that they've found themselves in. And we've talked about this many times on this program. Inflation is one of those things it's really hard to spin yourself out of because 
people keep noticing it. People keep going to the stores and seeing this, these numbers go up and up and up and up. They see the grocery bill go up. They see the, the gas pump uh, and how high it is. They keep noticing it in their life. They're hit in the face with it every single day. They might not be able to measure what a, a, a change in the minimum wage does to an economy. That's hard to understand. It's, it's a bunch of different steps. Prices are higher. My life is getting worse. My economy is getting worse. Everything I want to buy, I have to spend more on. I have less money to save. This is something that hits people right in the face every day. You can't tell them. You can't blame it on other things. It's your job to manage this. It's your job to be able to handle these things and make it so the, and you don't have to control the economy. The president doesn't have complete control over the economy. We don't want the president to have complete control over the economy, whether you like the president or not, but they have enough of a, of a, of a piece of this to cause real harm. And, you know, look, we can go back and we can talk about the causes of this because this is not from the very beginning of Biden's administration completely his fault. Remember, Donald Trump spent multiple trillions of dollars in coordination with Republicans and Democrats in Congress. They spent multiple trillions of dollars to flood the market to pay for COVID restrictions. Now, we can all sit here and we're going to get into this with Matt Kibbe in a second about which restrictions were right, which restrictions were wrong, and how do we hold the people responsible for, uh, for these restrictions? Uh, how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? And, and, and that's an important part of this conversation. But look, the government told us we had to all stay home. And so... Throwing money at everybody was the solution with almost no oversight, rushed through with barely any warning. That's going to cause inflation. Now, Joe Biden has done nothing but make this worse. He came into office and spent trillions more and wanted, remember, five trillion more dollars in spending, but was not able to actually get that yet. I don't think he's going to get five, but he'll probably get something before uh, this uh, this Congress uh, goes away, hopefully uh, very, very soon. But you go back to uh, the, there was the Trump spending and then Biden comes in and he wants to spend another trillion plus on a bunch of programs and supposed covid aid and his own economists, people who were on his side, people who served in the Obama administration, people like Jason Furman, people like Larry Summers came out and said, guys, like, we're generally with you. We were in the Obama administration. OK, that's how much we were with you. You know, when you were there doing nothing, we were doing actual work in the Obama administration. And I don't agree with these guys on everything by any means. However, they correctly pointed out, if you pass this, this is going to overheat the economy and we're going to have all sorts of inflation. You combine that with the supply shock uh, over in uh, with all the COVID all around the world and uh, demand bouncing back. The last thing we needed to do is juice demand. There wasn't enough products uh, to go around as it as it was. So now we juice demand by printing money. We get the inflation coming in. Now we can't, we're, with China going back into lockdown, we're having these problems all over again. And the long story short is that inflation is kind of out of control. I mean, they're at a point now where, look, Joe Biden uh, does not have the same vision for the country that you do or that I do. But he doesn't want to go into a, a midterm election with double digit inflation staring him in the face, but he might actually have to do that. He can't get this under control. He doesn't know what to do. He thinks he's going to spend his way out of this somehow. These people are freaking insane. Insane. So what's the solution here? Because right now, there doesn't seem to be one. Now, once November comes, if Republicans are able to get control, they will take office, of course, not until January. That's a long way away. And they can't stop all of this. They will uh, you know, I don't have tons of faith in the Republican Party generally, especially when it comes to spending. There's really no side of the spending debate anymore that isn't, you know, big government to me. But at least they can stop some of the worst excesses of the Biden administration, possibly. That is all we can hope for right now. Right now, this is all the control and all the cards are in Joe Biden's hands. And at some point, they're probably going to spend another 700 billion to 1.3 trillion dollars on another package at some point this year, maybe even squeezed in in the lame duck Congress before the new 
Congress takes their seats. This is all coming. This is going to get worse for a while. And we're going to be living with with this type of situation where, I don't know, you order a car and it doesn't get delivered for eight months at least. Not that I know anything about that type of stuff. I want to go into, uh, maybe we'll talk about trade and the supply shocks uh, that we've been facing lately, because there's a lot of criticism. Maybe we shouldn't be depending on places like China as much as we do. This has been quite an issue over the past few months. And we'll get into that as well as COVID restrictions. How do we hold the people accountable who decided to push all of these restrictions through and create all of these problems that we've been dealing with do those people ever get a comeuppance? Do they ever have to, are they ever voted out? Do they ever have to go through the, you know, to, to, to answer for their mistakes? Does that ever happen? We'll talk about that with Matt Kibbe next. Let me tell you about Chamonix. It's the best in skincare. If you're going to have skincare products, you might as well have the best one. And we're talking about products that can take 5, 10, 15 years off of your face with uh, Ultra Retinol Serum from GenuCell. Uh, Marina from Fort Lauderdale, Florida says, great product. My skin loves it. I've spent so much money on creams over the years, enough to pay off my house, which by the way, I happen to have a, a wife. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, this product changed my life like no other. Marina is flying high with GenuCell's new Ultra Retinol Serum. This technological wonder hydrates your skin at a cellular level and builds on the deep uh, moisture with incredible incredible anti-wrinkle effects of retinol. GenuCell.com slash stew is the place to go to get this stuff. For 50% off, you get that right now. If you go to GenuCell.com slash stew, you get 50% off the brand new Ultra Retinol Serum. You're going to be amazed with this or your money back. So is there a risk here? No. If you don't think it's working for you, if you think I put this stuff on and I'm really notice the difference, I don't think that's going to happen. But if it does, you can go to GenuCell and then they're going to give you your money back. GenuCell also has immediate effects for results in 12 hours or less free with your order. Go to GenuCell.com slash stew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash stew. You get free express shipping, free returns, great customer service at GenuCell.com slash stew, GenuCell.com slash stew. Joining me now is Blaze TV's Matt Kibbe. He's the host, of course, of Kibbe on Liberty and president of Free the People. Matt, thanks for coming back on the program. It's good to be back. Great to see you, man. Yeah. Um, all right, let's start here. Scale of one to 10. One being Shanghai-style lockdown, 10 being 2019 America. Where are we right now? It depends where you live. I live in Washington, D.C., and, and I think that I fully expect the mayor, who's been a total tyrant this entire time, come back with mandated masks and, and gyms and all sorts of awful things, vac sports to, mm -hmm. to show in restaurants. And, and I just won't comply. So I, I've spent a lot of time recently driving to Virginia, but I think they've set up a paradigm and that the structure where they want to keep bringing this stuff back because it gives them more power, it gives them more control. In, in the District of Columbia is just one example She's had rolling emergency more orders for over two years now. They're still in effect, which means she can do whatever she wants. And why would any mayor or any governor that's getting away with that give it up? Yeah, I mean, it gives it's you so much power freedom. now, right? Yeah, I mean, th th there's a there's apparently a an emergency order here in Texas still, which has been kind of a controversial thing, particularly within the walls of this building. Yeah, yeah. And like, it, it is a strange thing that we allow, even in a place like Texas. This power to the executive branch of a state that can kind of just roll over all of the normal freedoms we have. Yeah, I, and I, I think ultimately there will be a constitutional reckoning on the fact that under an emergency, you can't get your day in court. There is no due process. Um, the normal rules that, that govern um, society and justice in the United States are just suspended. And by rolling them over so many times, You've, you've totally used any concept of, well, we better give the executive a little bit of power in an emergency to do something. That's mm. not what they're doing. No, no. We, it, it seems to me, this is like, uh, this is the same thing I thought of when all the stuff was going on with OSHA and the vaccine mandates. It's like, we, OSHA is something that I know you've talked about a million times. This needs to be reined in. Yep. This idea that these agencies can just kind of come in and, and put in these, you know, very broad rules that affect tons of people. 
And this particular one was blocked. But, uh, you know, going forward, they don't seem to have any limits on their power. Yeah, and it's a new strategy by the executive branch. They're going to do it even though they know they'll probably eventually lose in court. And, and Senator Mike Lee makes a really important point about this. The problem is not that executives are abusing power because they will. They do. That's who they are. Um, the problem is that Congress is not never takes its responsibility mm. um, to legislate and to rein in an executive power. They defer. They like all of these vague rules. I guarantee you that a majority in Congress, including most Republicans, love the fact that OSHA did it so that they didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Because then they can they can um, get the benefits but never take responsibility. Yeah, maybe we're going a little far afield here, but I'm fascinated by this topic because I am on the Mike Lee bandwagon on this one. And I, I it strikes me at the very least to be against the spirit of the Constitution, to be able to say, OK, trade. It's, it's supposed to be Congress doing it. But Congress says we are going to do it by letting the executive branch do it. Like we've decided as Congress that the executive branch should do it. Well, that's just overruling the Constitution. That's, that, that can't be right. Yeah, it, it can't be right. And we've let it go on for a long time. And I think one of the upsides of the last two years, which have been horrific trampling of the rule of law, is that there's there's going to be some some accountability in the courts, and I, I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah, I, I, and I think, so let, let's go back to COVID here, because, you know, the whole thing starts, there's the lockdowns, and there's one side of the argument that's saying, hey, we got to lock down, um, you know, everyone's got to you know, put yourself in your house, you're not allowed to go see anybody else, you can't see your family, the whole thing. Yeah. The other side, I would say, largely wasn't saying, you should go out and do everything you can. It was more like make your own decision, judge your own risk. Yeah. You know, I think that was the perspective that we came uh, from. And so now we've gone through this period. We've seen the economic uh, problems. We've seen the now inflation. We've seen that it wasn't really effective, didn't seem to really make much of a difference uh, any place it was tried. And as we're coming out of this now, uh, well, hopefully, I know you live in Washington, D.C., so I don't want to speak too soon. But as we're coming out of this, it feels like now the kind of the pandemic is over. It's felt like that in Texas for a while. It feels like a lot of places, though, that's uh, most of it is gone. Yeah. So what do we do? Because I didn't I was kind of of the idea of I don't want to necessarily go crazy trying to shove this in all of their faces until we get rid of it. Yeah. Because I, it's almost going to lock them in in concrete and they're never going to want to admit they were wrong. Now that these restrictions are gone, how do we hold them accountable? Well, that, I, I think the, the question is, um, are they willing to acknowledge what they did? And, and honestly, you're a little too generous. I, I feel like this has been just wall-to-wall -wall human devastation. You know, mm. masking kids in New York City, oh, yeah. um, destroying their, their development and their ability their emotional um, mindset, um, scaring them of everything, um, all of the you know deaths of despair, not to mention cardiovascular disease and cancer, all these things that we've done to people um, was a humanitarian disaster. Mm. And I think I would be fine if, if some of the architects of this just stepped up and said, you know what, we got it wrong. But that's not what they're saying. To this day, Fauci's saying, we're going to do it again, yeah. and we're going to do it harder this time because our only mistake is that we didn't go full, full China early. And that, to me, is why you have to sort of like uh, bury the idea and salt the earth. And part of that is holding the politicians accountable. And part of that will happen in this next election. I, th I think lockdown Democrats are going to get trounced. Mm -hmm. I hope lockdown Republicans get trounced, too. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one way to get to accountability. But the only reason I want to name names and call them out is that they want to do it again. Yeah. No, and I think it's – you didn't say anything I disagree with there. I mean, I, I totally agree with your analysis on that. I, I think I'm – I really want the courts to take these things on, too. You know, like th stuff like the, you know, the New Jersey gym that gets shut down and tries to open and uh, and is, you know, const the guy's constantly arrested. The, the, the barber shops. I want those courts to get I want those cases to get all the way to the Supreme Court and get a ruling. I want the churches, you know, that 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 were shut down even in the middle of two weeks to, to slow the spread. That one in particular, yeah. you're talking about. A, a guarantee from the Constitution that you're allowed to do this, right. and they try to limit it. If those things don't go through the process and get to the Supreme Court and we get a clear ruling on that, I'm really afraid, even if it's not COVID, 
you know, we all know there's going to be another Chinese virus that's bubbling up over the next 10 years, yeah. and they're going to try all this stuff again. All of our homegrown tyrants are waiting to see how far they can go next time. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're trying to figure out where the line is, and wherever it is, they're going. So we have to push back, and part of it is making sure that people understand this was an unmitigated health, public health disaster. Mm -hmm. Not COVID, but our response to COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that we had control over. We didn't, we didn't have to do that damage. Yeah, and you know, look, COVID was bad, but also we obviously didn't have control over it. You're seeing, you know, even China, who locked down from day one. I mean, we saw the videos early on of them welding people in apartments and all these terrible things. And they'd go for this zero COVID strategy, which, you know, I don't believe they, their numbers, obviously. They were completely ridiculous. But when you have an authoritarian government and you don't, I mean, you can, you don't mind locking down and punishing and throwing people in prison for violating minor rules, you can probably slow the spread of a disease to, at some level. But we're seeing now the zero COVID thing is just a myth. It can't happen. It didn't happen in Australia. It didn't happen in New Zealand. It's not happening in China. Shanghai is shut down. Uh, hasn't this just been disproved to a level that is beyond reasonable doubt? So zero COVID is, is the most radical version of this, and this is what China was hoping would be the new paradigm. Because in order to get to zero COVID, you need all sorts of authoritarian measures that, that the West, and particularly the United States, have not tolerated in the past. You know, things like social credit systems and and things like not, not just mandatory vaccine passports, but you know the queues where they test every day. And so they're willing to do the most horrific things to their citizens to prove that their theory was right, even though it's clearly not right. And Shanghai right now is on the verge of being a disaster somewhere between Tiananmen Square and the Great Leap Forward where millions of mm. Chinese people were, were starved to death because of a central plan that didn't care about them. It didn't give a damn about them. And, and to me, the, the Chinese system, and you need to understand this when you think about zero COVID, it's anti-human. It's all about the collective. And if we can save 49% of the people and we have to kill 20% of the people to do it, they're okay with it. Mm -hmm. But that's evil. Yeah. That's, that's like... It's not. It's it's more than un-American. It's just not acceptable on any place in this planet. It doesn't treat people as individuals at all. Yeah. Um, little sidebar here. One of the there's sort of the split among um, the right, I would say, where you know you and I are both on sort of the libertarian leaning side of, of this. Uh, I'm a big free trade proponent. Um, there is a uh, another side though of this argument that says, hey, look, look, at, we, we we open up trade, we open up trade to all these countries like Russia, uh, like China. We're seeing now the policies of a lockdown Shanghai are going to burn us in the future, right? There's going to be sh sh there's going to be supply shocks. We're going to have to deal with their mistakes, and this is an argument against free trade. How do you react to that? Well. Um a better example, like Shanghai is, is a real exogenous shock to sort of, the, you know, the tech industry and the things that we depend on. I, I like diversified portfolios. Um, part of the idea of having free trade is you're not dependent on any single source for any single thing. Mm. A, better uh, a better example is, is Russian energy. Europe unilaterally disarmed and, and on a very sort of pro-environment, anti-energy agenda became completely dependent on Russian oil. Well, now that has national defense implications for them, um, but that's not free trade. Okay. That's, that's, that's sort of some sort of exploitation where we're st we still need oil, but politically we're gonna pander to the environmentalists here and then we're just gonna import it from Russia. So I think, I think real free trade to me is, is um, trading with a lot of different countries and not being dependent on like, so when Russia cut us off or we cut them off, mm -hmm. Um, the Biden administration went hat in hand to tyrants in North Korea and Venezuela. <laughs> right, right. That, that, in North Korea, Iran, right? Iran, Iran, yeah, yeah Iran. Mm -hmm. um, I guess North Korea doesn't have oil. But, yeah, and they don't have much of anything. But what's up with that? That's yeah. That's not free trade. That's pathetic. No, it's pathetic, especially when you're a giant energy producer right. and can do all of this ourselves. Yeah. I mean, that's the mo that's the worst part of that one, I suppose. Um, okay, uh, last one I want to talk to you about because you you mentioned when we we're talking about COVID assessing your own risk and deciding to deal with it. And not it's not anyone else's responsibility to control um, what, what risk you're taking, right? You have to maintain your own risk, your own family's risk. It's not about people you're walking around at the grocery store. It's not their job to manage risk. You had an interaction with Kathy Griffin 
on Twitter. Can you kind of walk us through the scenario? How did it start? And uh, I saw how it ended, and I did like it. Yeah, so like I, it, I take this very personally. So this was a debate about the mayor of New York City actually firing a mom who was a city attorney mm. for criticizing his policy of masking three-year-olds. And um, she got fired, and a lot of people like myself um, spoke up to her and said, thank you for standing up. This is heroic, and, and I hope this fight's not over. Kathy Griffin tweeted at her. I think we have the tweets here. Yeah. Can we put them up? Uh, here, let's see. So uh, okay, uh, he, she says, okay, hear me out. Uh, I see that you follow me, Daniela. So I had half of my lung removed because I had cancer, and now I'm super high risk. What if people like me need your kids to wear masks in addition to us wearing ours because there are so many high-risk people? Come on, what do you say? And uh, your response was, okay, Kathy, hear me out. I can't tell if you're joking, but I actually had stage four cancer. Chemo destroyed my immunity, but I never expected others, especially children, to fundamentally change their lives so I could feel safer. I made choices because... I'm not a narcissistic sociopath. <laughs> it's, just a, it's good to hear that you're not, Matt. I'm, I'm not. And, and, and the idea that, think, think about this, and it, this wasn't a thing when I was sick almost 20 years ago, but the idea that one person with a compromised immunity could dictate how the rest of society lives in order to accommodate their fears is an insane idea to me. Yeah. When I was sick, um, I stayed home. And <laughs> you were in lockdown by choice. Yeah, like yeah. I, I have no immune system. And by the way, my, none of my doctors were wearing masks at the time. And maybe that's just old school or something. Yeah, hey. But we, we've socialized um, responsibility for health care so that if I'm overweight, if I have not taken care of myself, um, suddenly for the first time, I can blame someone else for it. So when they sold masks, it wasn't to keep yourself safe. It was to keep everybody else safe. When they sold vaccines, it wasn't to protect yourself. Right. It was to protect other people. And that turned out not to be true, obviously. But the danger here is that we've, we've socialized responsibility when it comes to our personal health. And the implications of that are disastrous for people. Yeah, you know, and, and I keep thinking to myself when we, as we were going through all of this, you know, they never at any point said, Hey, if you really care about protecting yourself from this, use an N95 mask. You know, right. you could wear, wear these high quality masks that probably do something unlike the cloth mask that everyone was talking about. And then you can worry about protecting yourself instead of other people. They kept going back to this community idea yeah. where everyone else, you know, uh, it, these liberals in, in New York City are walking around and they and if God forbid they have to have they have to depend on Cletus who comes into the same store as them to wear his mask. There's no way that's going to happen, right? People make different decisions. This is the United States of America. And, I mean, I think it was a flawed premise at the beginning, but it's certainly an un-American one. And everybody has different risk preferences, and it turns out that despite what Fauci told us, the science on a novel virus is not settled. Mm -hmm. you, you're learning things as you go. And, and I think, you know, in hindsight, the idea that you had to get vaccinated to protect me is now absurd. That yeah, just give simply yourself, yeah. wasn't true. Right, right. Um, but, you know, the idea that you could uh, sort of like take over everybody else's lives. And that's the thing, like as a cancer survivor, um, she just pissed me off because, you know, <laughs> three-year-olds in New York City have nothing to do with your personal health circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, Matt Kibbe, he's the president of Free the People. Also, make sure to check out uh, Kibbe, Kibbe on Liberty right here, of course on Blaze TV, part of your Blaze TV subscription, blazetv.com slash stew. Matt, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, sir. Well, we're gonna try to get Matt to move out of Washington, D.C. because I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how he still lives there. I don't know how he can handle it. But Matt, if you need a real estate agent, you gotta go to realestateagentsitrust.com. Glenn started this company a while ago, a company that allows you to kind of sort through the real estate agents in a new area, like let's say Texas. They've got plenty of them right here in Texas, Matt. Uh, and you can sort through and have them screened for you so you have the best one in your area. I feel like it's a big guessing game with real estate agents. You don't know if you're gonna get a good one. A lot of people just go on a website and whoever the agent is below the picture of the house they like, they call. 
That's not the best way to get a real estate agent. You should have someone on your side from the beginning. You can find that person at realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. Matt Kibbe, I'm telling you, realestateagentsitrust.com. Guys, one thing I want you to know, and this is something I want you to take home with yourselves today, to your families, your life doesn't matter if you're white. Um, Only black lives matter. All lives do not matter. Black lives matter. No other lives matter, with the exception of white people who say that they're black. If you identify as a black person, then you matter. Of course, that doesn't that then it's just black lives again. Now, if you're a black person who identifies as white, I think you still matter. I'm not sure how much you matter. Probably less. You probably matter less because if you're going to identify as white, your life doesn't matter as much. But we know that it might still matter, at least to people who don't know that you identify as white, which is their problem. And, you know, you expended too much energy to have to explain it to them. So I know you're tired from all that effort. Anyway, uh, BLM's under a little bit of a a little of a pressure right now. They're having a, a tough time. And this is what happens when people throw money at you for nothing other than supporting riots, typically. Um, but they throw billions of dollars at your organization. What do you do with it? I mean, I, as far as I know, the only thing you can do with it is to buy $6 million mansions, which is what they did with it. A real surprise here. We were all utterly stunned that this was a sham organization. And in the end uh, is, of course, uh, basically uh, what some would call allegedly a fraud in every single way possible. Uh, So uh, they decided to defend themselves now. They've realized this is not maybe a good look for them to buy $6 million mansions with donation money. (laughs) It's almost too good to be true, isn't it? It's almost too good to be true. Uh, I wouldn't even have asked for this. You know, sometimes you get, wake up Christmas morning, you don't open, open, up the, open up your present, and it's like such an amazing present. You almost feel bad getting it. It's like you're spoiled. It's just so utterly fantastic. Well, here's your present for today. Their pathetic explanation as to why they bought this $6 million house. Ready? There have been a lot of questions surrounding recent reports about the purchase of Creator's House in California. That's what they're calling this thing. Uh, despite past efforts, BLMGNF recognizes that there are, is more work to do to increase transparency and ensure transitions in leadership are clear. So the person who, got, who you know, was fired for buying all those other million-dollar houses, they should have probably said she didn't work there anymore after she bought all the million-dollar houses and the transparency. The thing is, if we just told you we were buying $6 million mansions, you would have been fine with it. But we weren't clear about it up front, and that's the real problem here. We know narratives like this cause harm to organizers doing brilliant work across the country, and these reports do not reflect the totality of the movement. We apologize for the distress this is caused to our supporters and those who work in service of capital B Black Liberation Daily. We also recognize the confusion recent inflammatory and speculative articles have caused. See, it's their fault for you buying the $6 million mansion because they were inflammatory with their articles about it. That's why this is a problem. We are redoubling our efforts. I love that word, redoubling, because doubling and then redoubling. So like four times the effort, which, of course, before was zero. So it's four times zero. I don't know what that is. I'm not a mathematician, but figure it out. We are redoubling our efforts to provide clarity about BLM GNF's work. In the coming weeks, we will unveil new initiatives to increase transparency, that word once again, and accountability, and to continue reshaping what radical philanthropy looks like for capital B, black people. BLM GNF is working diligently to increase operations transparency, including an internal audit, tightening compliance operations. Yeah, maybe they are a little loose, aren't they? And creating a new board to help steer the organization to its next evolution. Wait a minute. I thought you guys were this amazing organization. Why would you need to involve uh, evolve at all? You're so fantastic. But now I remember transparency. Black creativity is necessary. By the way, it's capital B. Um, It's at the beginning of a sentence, though, so I didn't mention it. And vital to capital B, black survival. BLM 
has always held that tradition sacred, partnering with artists of every kind since our founding, and now the big unveil of their transparency. That's why Creator's House was purchased, to provide a space for black, capital B, black folks, to share their gifts with the world and hone their craft as they see fit under the conditions that work best for them and outside systems of oppression in creative industries. I will say, no one has ever been oppressed inside a $6 million mansion. Uh, well, I, mean, I mean, if you separate you know, people like Jeffrey Epstein, a lot of dictators all around the world. And, but not these people, not these capital B black people. They will be allowed to, to paint and whittle wood into different sculptures and shapes all inside a $6 million mansion. And that, by the way, was, you know that now because of their incredible movement toward transparency. I know what you're thinking. Stu, I want an amazing belt that's comfortable, fashionable, and customizable, but I don't want to have to go all the way to Europe to get it. Well, guess what? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, probably not. You probably could have ordered it online, but honestly, you should probably instead go to Grip6. Grip6, you can order stuff online. It's a small company in Utah that sells in the United States, but also all over the world. Why do they sell all over the world? Because people would rather have their stuff than stuff in Europe. They, this is awesome. It's really durable. It's really cool. Uh, you're going to like it. Uh, they're sort of minimalist, and you can customize them. Uh, you know, laser etched designs, logos, flags, all sorts of cool stuff on the belt buckle to make it personal. You can get carbon fiber as well, so you don't set off the metal detectors at the airport, which is great if you have to be traveling a lot. You know that, that whole game. And if that uh, wasn't enough, Grip6 also carries an awesome selection of socks and wallets you can check out as well. This is a great company. This is a company that's based in the United States that carries about the United States that sources everything in the United States, it's Grip6. Get to know them. Grip6.com slash stew. Use the code stew to save 15%. Grip the number 6.com slash stew. Get 15% off today. Look, I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't take any joy in doing it. But I must do it. It's time to bring back the Andrew Cuomo is awful mug. I think he might be the next lieutenant governor of New York. Uh, why? They need one, uh, apparently. Uh, you may not know Brian Benjamin. He'd been in office for like a minute, but now he's not in office anymore. No more minutes for Brian Benjamin. He was arrested today in a federal corruption investigation and then subsequently has resigned. So they had Cuomo and Hochul under Cuomo, and I should be specific with Cuomo. He, she, she wasn't actually under, but she was she was the the lieutenant governor. OK. And then Cuomo leaves and Hochul gets elevated. Then they put Brian Benjamin in the uh, lieutenant governor slot. And now Brian's out. So that's we need to get into this a little bit more tomorrow. It's too good. But I will remind you this. Andrew Cuomo is awful dot com. Don't be a terrible person. Don't be a terrorist. Don't be a communist. Subscribe to this podcast. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to rate and review this podcast. This one comes in with an idea. Do the Judge Jackson song instead of your theme on the podcast until you get to one million subs. Which I think is, a, we're right, we're almost there. We're almost to one million subs. I'm just not sure which song they're referring to. Do we know? Ketanji Brown Jackson, she is for real. Never had a justice quite like her. She's a former public defender. Ketanji Brown Jackson, she is for real. Checking my phone, we seem to be going down in subscri subscriptions. I'm not sure why, why that's not working. 